guys, welcome back to our ecology lecture number two, and we're going to be talking about the cycles of life, so to speak. And uh, the three cycles we're going to talk about today are the water cycle, uh, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. Well, we're going to start off with the water cycle right here, and what we see here is a little water ecosystem that myself and my daughter helped to uh, construct. Uh, I have a little heron uh, protection system here, so we have a great blue heron that comes in and likes to eat our koi, which you can't quite see. We had a rainstorm last night. So what drives the water cycle? The sun drives the water cycle. It leaves, it causes evaporation of the water, which then rises into the clouds, and as that water rises up into the atmosphere, the atmosphere gets colder, it begins to condense into the clouds, and when enough water vapor has, of course, uh, formed in those clouds, it then falls as rain, which we see here. Um, we had a big rainstorm last night, so you can see some of the water dripping out of the ground. This is an important concept. Some of that water does soak into the ground. Most of it will run off, or a lot of it will run off into streams and lakes and rivers, where evaporation continues, and so on and so on, okay? So, uh, water is extremely important for life on this planet. We don't know any life forms that can live without water. Um, a very small amount of water is actually available to our use. About 1% of all the total water on the planet is available to us in the forms of clean, drinkable water. Um, most of the water is salt. About 75% of the ocean of the water on this planet is in the form of the ocean water, uh, which we can't directly use. About another 30% of that water, or not 36%, but about 24% of that water is locked up in glaciers. Another 3 or 4% is in groundwater. And finally, we have the surface water uh, that we can tap for our personal use. So that's the water cycle. Now we're going to talk about the carbon cycle. And we're going to go over here. Carbon cycle. We use carbon for all sorts of things. It is the basis of macromolecules in our bodies. Okay, it forms the carbon skeletons of proteins and fats and nucleic acids and so on and so on. Okay, but this is paper. Paper is made from wood. Wood is comes from trees, and trees photosynthesize. They take carbon dioxide from the air and convert it into sugars. And those sugars are converted into things like cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose units. So what I like to do with carbon, such as paper and cardboard in our home, is I like to put it into the paper shredder. There it goes. And then take that paper shredded carbon, and this is, this is all carbon, and what we're going to do with it is uh, my daughter's going to follow me. go through our garden. There's my dog, Elsa. Hey, Elsa. She's a three-legged dog. And so what I like to do with carbon, okay, because uh, is I like to take it and I like to put it into my compost pile. There goes my paper in the compost pile. We had some takeout pizza the other day. I like to take the boxes. Uh, this is nice and wet because it rained hard last night. I'm going to shred all this up. And again, this is all carbon. It's cellulose. All right, so what are we going to do with it? I'm going to put it into my compost pile here. Okay, I'm just going to shred this thing up. Great way to break up cardboard, by the way, is just leave it out in a rainstorm. And then, take my handy dandy pitchfork. We're going to turn this over. And my daughter's going to come over here and get a close-up of some of this. And what we're doing is we're we also put all my kitchen scraps in here. And we're turning this into dirt. All right. Here's some older compost right here. It has lots of leaves in it. I'm going to take some of this out. And what do we got down here? Let's see if we can get some close-ups. So we see some leaves in here. I'm looking for some worms. There's one, okay? These are decomposers. They're helping to break down that organic material. 
Plus, there are billions of billions of bacteria in here. There's some fungus growing in here. I could probably look at all these worms in here. There's a worm. There's a worm. All right, I could probably find some roly polies. It's actually probably a little wet for roly polies. But this carbon is being converted into a form. Of, it's being converted into dirt. So what I like to do with this is I will put this onto my sifter here. And this is just a quick thing. And we'll sift it like this. Break it up a little bit more. And we'll get a nice soil that we can then put into my gardens over here. And we take that carbon and nitrogen and we turn it into food that we can now eat in my family. I got three different types of lettuces here, some onions, some squash planted over here, tomatoes over here, peppers. Radishes. Radishes and, and uh, some beans all growing over in this area. So that carbon gets comes from the atmosphere in the form of an inorganic carbon, CO2. It gets taken up by plants in the process of photosynthesis where that inorganic carbon gets converted into organic sugar molecules, glucose. Then the plant is either going to use that glucose, that stored sugar, for its own processes using cellular respiration to convert the glucose into ATP so it can grow and use that energy. Or an animal such as myself is going to come along and grab a little bit of red lettuce leaf. Mm. Nah, that's good. That's a lot better than kudzu. <laughs> and we're going to take that carbon source into us and we're going to convert it into organic molecules that our body uses. We're going to either use it directly as a food resource, convert that energy in the carbon and the sugar molecules of the plant into ATP that helps fuel our body, or we'll convert it into macromolecules that our body uses to grow. So carbon cycle, I'm exhaling, I'm putting out CO2, the plants are going to use that. Last cycle I want to talk about is the nitrogen cycle. If I look up into the sky, nice blue sky, that is the source for nitrogen. Seven, over close to 80% of the air we take in is in the form of N2 gas, nitrogen gas. Completely inaccessible to us or to plants. We can't use it. So how the heck does the plants get it into there? It's going all the way back to this compost. As I said earlier, this little handful I have right here probably has a hundred billion bacteria in it. Okay, Those bacteria are called nitrogen fixing bacteria. They're able to take nitrogen gas and turn it into compounds such as ammonia or nitrates that plants can now take up. Now, ammonia and nitrates are also inorganic compounds. There's no carbon. And ammonia is NH3, nitrate is NO3, so nitrogen, oxygen, that's it. Ammonia is nitrogen and hydrogen, no carbon, so it's not an organic compound. So we can't use it, but plants can. And of course, plants take that nitrogen, convert it into amino acids, things of that, that we then consume. And that's, that's how we get our nitrogen into our bodies, by eating plants or by eating animals that eat the plants, much against my daughters. Uh, <laughs> as she is a vegetarian. So, anyways, that is the nitrogen cycle. It's the important. All right. So that will, that those were the three cycles that you really need to have a general idea about: the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. I will be adding some diagrams at the end of this video lecture. Uh, that you should look at and know and probably will also be putting up some additional resources for you to look at these cycles. One of the things we're also going to look at uh, in this unit is how we as humans have affected these three important cycles. There's also another one called the phosphorus cycle which we will talk about uh, briefly but those are the three biggies that I need you to know about. All right we'll see you next time.
Okay, as you look at this diagram, you will see that the sun is once again driving the evaporation and transpiration from plants of water. As that water vapor rises into the atmosphere, it's going to condense as the atmosphere gets cooler and fall as precipitation, which then goes back into the ground, percolates into the water, runs off into streams and rivers and such. There are two reservoirs for carbon in on our planet. One is in the atmosphere where it is in the form of CO2 and the other is going to be basically in the ground and in living organisms. Uh, in the ground, long-term storage is going to be found in coal, natural gas, oil, and in limestone. Whereas short-term storage is going to be in organic matter because those organisms can only live for a certain amount of time before they die. So the problem we have today with excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a result of taking that long-term storage of carbon and burning it in the form of fossil fuels. The other way we can get carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is through the mining of limestone and the creation or uh, of concrete because when we make concrete we release also carbon back into the atmosphere. So th these two events, fossil fuels and concrete, lead to an increase in CO2. As you can see in this diagram, nitrogen can get into the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuels and also from the losses coming from the ground itself. As animals uh, uh, release waste products, that will also put nitrogen back into the ground in the form of ammonia and as they die and decompose. But again, um, we need bacteria in the soil to convert these forms of nitrogen into means by which plants can take them up. And plants can really only take up um, nitrates, NO3. Uh, I said earlier that bacteria do convert nitrogen gas into forms of ammonia and nitrates, but it's not all bacteria. Only certain types of bacteria we call nitrogen-fixing bacteria can do that. Many of these live in certain types of plants, such as beans and uh, bean, tr bean re relatives. So when we plant beans or alder trees, they can actually take and put nitrogen back into the soil because they have this uh, symbiotic relationship with these nitrogen fixing bacteria which live in their roots. So they're very good types of plants to plant in between certain types of crops and you might have heard the term cover crops before. The other way we can get nitrogen into the soil of course is through the application of fertilizers which basically is a commercial way to take nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and make it nitrates that plants can use. However, this is very energy uh, costly and has led to excess nitrogen into our environments and especially in water systems, which leads to this term we call eutrophication, which leads to algal blooms and things of that nature, which are really detrimental to lakes and rivers.